I now like to welcome uh, Dr. Nilima Sonavne, DHS, ADHS, Nursing Health Services, Government of Maharashtra on stage to deliver her keynote speech for Voice of Healthcare Nursing Conclave. Unfortunately, in the morning she was stuck in the traffic so she wasn't able to. Uh, welcome ma'am, let's give her a huge round of applause. Hello everyone and uh, good afternoon one and all. Uh, esteemed colleagues from nursing fraternity and healthcare services, today I came to know one very important thing. Even though you are in the first in line or serial number, if you are not maintaining time or time management, you have to stand at the last. <laughs> I'm Dr. Nirina Sanami. I am ADHS nursing as I rightly said. And uh, yes, since morning, uh, there was lots of uh, deliberation or I would say intellectual deliberation on the different topics from the esteemed speakers and panelists. So today, uh, I will speak uh, something very, very practical, okay? Uh, recently, I joined as an ADH, just before that, I was in the nursing education. And when I was a principal or uh, the teacher, I used to be very, very assertive and used to speak very assertively and very, very dominating way with my, uh, you know, uh, authority who was from the government officers, okay, who were uh, the government uh, uh, part or my officers and they were, you know, uh, something I did not like their approaches toward the nursing profession or education. You might be seeing my, uh, uh, my messages or how I talk in the various nursing group, but now, I am sitting along with them as a part of government. So what I came to know, they were not wrong. Okay? So now I came to know that representation from nursing was not there. This post is been filled after 30 years, three decades. There was no nursing leadership in the government. So, what government is doing for the, uh, you know, uh, for uh, uh, nurses, the topic which is given to me, and I, please consider my apology for being late because I was busy in my professional commitment in the morning, that was also part of policy. So topic which was given to me in the morning was policy and policy initiative of government of Maharashtra for nursing profession. So if I would like to speak on this topic, it will take around two to three hours, but topic I have to cover within 10 minutes. So I will not speak very deeply in this uh, aspect. So let's speak something about what government is doing. We always see that any file which goes in the government office take long time. And now I came to know, I used to say, hey, why these people are taking so much time? Now I came to know why this time is been taken. There are lots of stages where the file moves, okay? And when it reaches to the highest place or step, then it will be around uh, one month or one and a half month or two months, six months or sometimes one year. So that decision making is very, very difficult because at every stages, the people or officer have their own understanding and their own decision making, their own views on that particular aspect. That is the reason why some of the permission is not being granted to private colleges or there are so many issues. So what government is doing for the nursing profession, at a glance, whenever you are starting new nursing college, you require permission from the government, that is very important thing. Even though it takes little more time, but ultimately you get the permission. That is very important. As you know, there are two departments <coughs> of government which is separated in 1970. That is DHS, that is uh, the Director of Health Services and the Director of Medical Education and Research. Okay, these are these two different departments are working and this GR, Okay, what you are waiting for to start new college that we are providing as a government. We as a, I'm representing the government. So the next, if you would like to enhance the seat, 
that also for permission is required from the government. Okay. If at all your college is, you know, working very uh, nicely or following all the uh, protocols, so in between we have inspection and for inspection we recognize or continue or they recognize the institution. Now, these two departments, I said, working separately for education and service. For nursing service, these are, you know, in general part, I say, but as far as the nursing service overall is concerned, what we do, you might have seen the mega bharti of DHS, you might have some uh, participate in the same, in that mega bharti we do recruitment for the various posts, that is staff nurses and tutors and PHN and public health nurses and uh, pediatric nurses. So we have already started a mega bharti, that is a very positive thing from the government. Because there are lots of vacancies, still there are vacancies and we are working to fill the vacancies. Very soon uh, you will get the ad from DHS also. Already. We appear for exam of DMR, and again we are, you know, uh, publishing the ad for a staff nurses post from our side. Then after recruitment, if you are posted in any of the hospital, then you will get all those facilities which is for the government server. Means the orientation or induction, various trainings, time bound increments, then you will get the medical reimbursement, all facility, all the patient, uh, various kind of patient we have, like old patient and new patient, you will get the new now. Then you will, uh, uh, whichever program or the national program is implemented by the government, that training is implemented for the nurses. That is a great benefit we nurses have. All the national program before, you know, its implementation, the various trainings is being conducted for the various categories of nurses. Right from the AM, LHVs and PHN, all, all categories the training is being uh, conducted. Same way for tutor also. You, there are two channels of promotion in government. That is, is, one is promotion, okay, as for the seniority, and one is from by nomination through the exams, okay. So, when the candidates nominated on the same post, say the tutor post in the government, so we have a good induction program for them. Even though uh, we have, you know, uh, various colleges, like in government, we have 23 GNM colleges, 32 ANM colleges, 36 LHA colleges, so many colleges we have. We have scarcity of teachers, okay, but what we are doing now, we are appointing the nurses from the clinical, not all, by rotation. So, those MSc nurses with specialty gets opportunity to be a teacher. So, they can get a promotion later on the post of tutor. But before that, we give them this opportunity so that may a kind of orientation or induction kind of things that is also started in government. For all the posts that induction program is there, for nurses with all those facilities, what is very important is their in-service training, okay? So we are giving them an opportunity for 24 months full uh, payment training or educational leave, we can say, so we sanction for them. So they can uh, go for the higher training and for the professional development. So after BSc nursing, they can, uh, you know, have uh, MSc degrees and we are encouraging them for the PhD program also. So this is also very important and leave is sanctioned for them. Then for service, we are giving the maternity leave. Even it is compensated for the private uh, hospitals also. So that 180 days of leave, they can take in, you know, uh, in part as per the uh, requirement or as per the, their uh, need. So that is also a great benefit for them. So for nursing education, this teacher also is being promoted on the various posts. Earlier there was no college, hardly few, uh, one college was there, that is PG College uh, INE. Now there are two college, PG College and six BSc College we have at the government side. 
and 23 plus 10. So 43 GNM colleges we have. So for that also we have appointed the teachers. Now the teacher, uh, you know, student ratio also is been maintained well. We get some of the fund from central government, okay, for upgradation of the nursing school to the colleges. That is also going on and for training also. So uh, before this, uh, there was a session on uh, infection prevention and control. So we also have a, a great uh, training on leadership in infection prevention and control. <coughs> that fund is provided by the central government and it is implemented at the uh, state level. So in future, we will also work together under CSR or uh, say uh, public-private community partnership that way. So that kind of training also is being given to the teachers as well as nurses. For teachers we and for the nurses, we have various awards. You might be knowing about the Florence Nightingale Award at state level and the national level. Then we have a best uh, principal, best, best teacher, best staff nurses, various kind of awards has been given to them. For education, we are planning uh, various uh, conferences, government is supporting for the same. But we are lacking like uh, not this kind of conferences uh, we are uh, conducted so far. But this conclave has given one message that nurses also can plan and organize a conclave or conference at Five Star Hotel. <laughs> that represents our uh, you know, projection in the community that we also not less than anyone else. Because usually the medical doctors conferences are always planned and organized at the five star hotels. So this conference also uh, a great message to the organizer or our authority that nurses also can plan this kind of a great conferences. So government is planning all the way, but uh, somewhere there are some uh, lacunas. I am not there to speak about the lacunae, but being a nurse, I can. There should be a directorate because even though I am working on the highest post in nursing in government setting, but majority of the, since this post was vacant since 30 years, three decades, so all the rights were in the hand of a medical doctor. So it was a challenge for me to establish myself. So what did I did? I studied my job responsibility first. I said, let me know what this ADH is supposed to do. And then after three months, I was continuously reading something like what I'm supposed to do. And because I was seeing like everything has been handed over because no one was there first. And now I came to know like what is my job responsibility. And gradually I'm, you know, raising my voice that same kind of assertiveness very gradually I'm, you know, presenting in front of them. To say one example, many of the organization and institution came forward telling me that the rural experience is not provided by your authority. So we couldn't give the rural experience to our students. So that was their demand on request, like please do something. So I said, what is to be done? And one meeting was organized with our highest authority. So I got this opportunity to speak on behalf of our nurses. So basically, I am the community health nurse. And the topic was related to community <coughs> health nursing, which is very, very close to my heart. So very kindly, because there was two GR. So 150 rupees per student per day, per pot, something like that, that GR was there. And it was clearly mentioned, this permission is given only for three years. And after three years, the organization or institute should have their own hospital. Okay, this is a common thing. Yeah? So in that meeting, our commissioner is very kind, very intelligent IS officer. And I said, so, full syllabus of GNM, BSc nursing is inclined toward the community health nurses or the health system. You are telling rightly that institute after three years should have their own hospital. That is the norms we can understand. Can 
these institutions start their own sub-center, PSC, rural hospital, or district or sub-district hospital, center. I say, but in their syllabus, the experience they should get in this healthcare or the level of healthcare hospitals, if this national health program is being implemented at that level, so we should provide them. Otherwise, their syllabus will be incomplete. And with incomplete syllabus, we will prepare a bogus nurses. Then he said, hey, you are right. So he said, like, take all those charge, find out the institution, find out the program, how many hospitals are uh, needed and how long it is needed. So you just find, find out and give permission to them. So that thing, that policy is going on right now. So, I need to say the moral of this story is that there was no voice from the nursing side. If at all we explain them well, definitely the authority is not bad. They will definitely give permission. So I was thinking, I was fighting with them. Hey, you have done this and you are not giving nursing. This. So many things. Now I came to know. Our voice, our leadership, morning we had a very great session on the leadership. That leadership was not The apex position in nursing was vacant. Now also DMR, there is no SNS, which is the apex position. And the position was for those on the seniority base whose six months or one year is remaining of service. They, will, they can't take decision because their retirement should be, you know, smooth. But I have five years with me. If the age is 58, if the age is 60, then I have two more added here. So I have time to learn and you know gradually make government or the officers to understand the nursing point of view, nursing as a profession and its upgradation. And really they listen, they work and small small thing has been asked. What is the difference between PVBSE nursing and basic BSE nursing? Then I understood that I have to start from the, this level. And really now it is, the things are working well. And uh, definitely one day uh, we will work together like all, uh, you know, this uh, voice of healthcare and all the private uh, stakeholders and all. So we can have a good uh, time that we can plan a program for upgradation of the nursing profession as a well. whole. So this was some of the, uh, you know, uh, points from government point of view uh, and uh, thank you so much, Voice of Healthcare. Even though I lost that opportunity in the morning, then I asked Madam, Madam, what will happen to me? Then they said, no, it will happen to me, it will happen to me, it will happen to me. Then I told one of my friends that I will go to the office. So I said, okay, let me have some lunch and then I can go. Then ma'am came, he said, okay. खाना खाने के बाद में आपको थोड़ा टाइम मिलेगा। तो थैंक यू सो मच मैडम। बिकॉज़ इट वाज़ अ स्मॉल टॉप, बट इट वाज़ अ ग्रेट बीइंग अ पार्ट ऑफ यू नो गवर्नमेंट, इंटरैक्टिंग विथ ऑल, लिसनिंग टू यू ऑल, एंड रियली इट वाज़ अ ग्रेट एक्सपीरियंस, एंड डेफिनेटली मैडम वील वर्क टुगेदर इ if you are determined to learn, if you are determined to learn, because no one wants to be a learner, but if you are determined to learn, no one can stop you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nirma, for your uh, lovely keynote speech. I now request uh, Ms. Sinki Chahar on stage to please say Dr. Nirma. Let's have a huge round of applause.
which is titled as Evidence Based Practices to Reduce Nursing Burnout and Turnover. Here we will explore the strategies to enhance the well being of the nursing profession. Let's invite our speakers on the stage. I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Sini Siju, Director, Nursing Services at Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation. Let's hear for her. A huge round of applause. <laughs> Ms. Sindhu Nair, Deputy Nursing Superintendent, Tata Memorial Hospital. <laughs> Dr. Sneha Vedya, Regional Nursing Director, Western Region, Apollo Hospitals. Let's hear a huge round of applause for her. Ms. Rosalind Matthews, Director, Nursing Services, Just Low Hospital. And Dr. Belinda Savant, Director, Nursing Services at Safety Hospital. <laughs> Let's have a huge round of applause for our stellar panel. <laughs> Dr. Belinda Savant will be moderating this event. So over to you, Dr. Valenda. Hello. 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 Hi. So good evening to all of you. And before the experts on the dais speak out, a few questions to the audience who are here since morning. What are the global concerns that we have? Global concerns we have. Sorry. Climate change. Hunger. Yes, any two more? Okay. It's a global challenge. Yes. And one more. Yes. I am not interested in nursing. So, these are the few, few global challenges we face, right, from political, social, environmental, health, right? Now, what are the major nursing uh, concerns or nursing global challenges we face? Shortage of nurses, very good. Anything else? Stress, very good. Sorry? Attrition, turnover. Yes. In the morning when we came, we seen this whole room, you know, packed. And I was, uh, till yesterday, uh, talking to Ms. Khushbu that please let my nurses join the conference, join the conference. She said, sorry ma'am, the seats are full. <coughs> but now, uh, then I asked her, how many seats do you have? She said, 200. So, now what we can see in this room is attrition. Yes or no, Ms. <laughs> Rosalind? 200. Okay, that's fine. So, just how we have attrition in this conference room, likewise, we also have attrition in the nursing fraternity or nursing profession. And on this note, we go ahead with our today's panel discussion, evidence-based practices to reduce nurses' burnout and turnover. So, we all have heard the word burnout, right? We have heard the word burnout. Yes. Have you felt burnout? Yes. When? So we will put it something like this, pre-COVID and COVID era, right? In the pre-COVID era, we all, see, we all heard about burnout, we spoke about burnout, but in the COVID era, we really felt what is burnout. And it has been uh, said that almost more than half of the nurses experience this feeling of burnout at least once in their you know, uh, professional life. And burnout not only affects the individual or the nurses, but it has a high impact on the organization and the patients that they take care of. And one of the reasons why there is turnover or attrition of nurses 
is related to burnout. As per the WHO norms, there has to be one, three nurses for, uh, for a thousand per population. But in our country, as per 2022, uh, 2022 data, we have got one, we got three million nurses for 1.3 billion population. That is, one nurse has to take care of 20 to 30 nurse, 30 patients. And by 2024, we have to have more than 4.3 million nurses to meet this target. So, I hope we all understand what is the disparity, what is the huge gap between the demand and the supply. So, on this note, I would like to uh, address a few questions to our experts on the ties and just how we have started this session by asking a few questions to all of you. There are four strategical points which, are, which is going to go to one of these uh, experts. You please keep your strategies in mind because we would like to hear from you, especially from the younger generation because you are the future of healthcare. Okay, so please pay attention and contribute what you think can be done better to help or to reduce nurses burnout and to reduce the nurses attrition rate, especially in our country. So the first question is to Ms. Ani. Nurses burnout has an impact on nursing turnover. So Sunny, can you highlight studies that support the statement with emphasis on key contributing factors? Thank you, Ms. Belinda. And I can see some or see some burnouts happening behind because it's a long day. We'll keep it short and we'll keep it interactive. I would start with a statement by one of the learners. If you and I have made a choice to create what we care the most, why should there be a burnout? You and I have chosen to do nursing and to create nursing into a beautiful thing, then why you and I should have a burnout? But yes, as Ms. Belinda was saying, there are contributing factors where evidences show that 54% of the healthcare workers and one among them is nurse who goes through this burnout throughout their lifetime. Now what will be the contributing factors? Before that, what is burnout? Anybody knows what are the factors or what are the, what's the definition of burnout? Anybody from the audience? Uh, we would like participation from the audience. What's burnout in nursing? Yeah. Constant feeling of overwhelm, feeling of being overwhelmed. True. As she rightly said, something which I am not able to match with the environment as a result and emotional exhaustion. Something which causes a depersonalization when I am not able to match with the organization. And something where I start doubting myself and my abilities. That's called as burnout. Leading to turnover as one of the contributing factors. Now, what are the major contributing factors for burnout? Now, for example, if there are three desks in front of me, for example, I consider this desk as an organization, this desk as an employee, and this desk as a market. Organization has its own personality. When an employee enters into an organization, needs to identify the personality of the organization, whether it matches their traits of resilience, their traits which will help them marry to this organization. So if this doesn't happen because the organization has its personality, has its leadership variables, which they utilize to select an employee, Similarly, an employee 
uses its traits and requirements for the future and cultural impacts to select the organization. If these two do not amalgamate with each other, the third party takes the upper hand, that is the market. Because when we consider nursing, the market is elastic. You have lots of opportunities you utilize to develop yourself, to develop yourself to utilize the organization and your personality to make a lane to enter into the market. So that's how burnout becomes one of the reasons for this mismatch that happens in the organization and in the employer. As a result, these will be the contributing factors, that is the nature of the organization, the nature of the employee, and the nature of the market, which plays a role in burnout and turnover. Thank you, uh, Sinil. Uh, well mentioned about what are the factors that cause burnout and it is applicable to our field too, to us as professionals. The next question is to Dr. Sneha. Research suggests that staffing ratios and workload impact nurses' burnout and turnover. What evidence-based approaches can be employed to optimize staffing and workload management? Just a word to the audience. This is a question to you too. One of the strategies. Please make your points. Sneha. So very difficult uh, question. And uh, yes, I have read so many evidence practices that are there. Uh, very difficult to pick one. I, uh, I was just going through the uh, n number of evidence-based practices, the researches that are done. And uh, both India and abroad, they talk about different strategies. If you go and check the websites or you check the certain researches that are done, you will find that at different levels, especially at the pre-COVID era, uh, uh, era uh, during the COVID and post-COVID, I can tell you that a lot of studies have been done only to identify how these burnouts have happened. Burnouts uh, are at different levels. Uh, at abroad, it would be of a different kind of a scenario. In Indian uh, area, it would be of a different kind of a scenario because the practices being same, the protocols and the governing bodies that manage are both different. So if you ask me, there were various, uh, you know, key points that I will uh, just read to you, which I had read when I was uh, uh, reading the research that has uh, been done across. So one talks about pay parity. Definitely, uh, you can't do the comparison between India and abroad. So that is one of the reasons uh, that they talk about the burnout. Second, not able to identify the patient complexity of illness and the staffing not being proportionate to that. That could be one of the uh, reasons. Second is the duty hours that are there. Uh, yes, recently with the COVID that was there in India, we all have transitioned to 12 hour shift, which was never the case in the Indian scenario. It was very, very hand-picked hospitals which had only done a 12-hour shift and that happened only because of the transition that had happened because of the COVID and we had lost many nurses who had gone back to their native place not willing to work during the COVID while many of them remained and we had to shift back those uh, practices from eight hours. So that was definitely a huge burnout but we withstood all those uh, measures that were there. Then I can talk about certain work environment. I would not want to talk about this because these are very, very sensitive kind of, uh, you know, things that we can read in different researches that are there. And there are many, many more contributory factors that does talk about the burnout. Ms. Roslyn, what role does leadership play in combating nurses' burnout and turnover? And how can evidence-based leadership practice support nursing staff? And we have many leaders out here, Roslyn, in our midst. So keep your answers ready. So, uh, can you, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. So good evening, everyone. I know it is a pleasure to be here, and uh, it is a pleasure to address. I I have seen so many familiar faces uh, in the audience, so I am sure that this is going to be a good discussion, despite the thinning crowd. And I understand that perfectly because in Mumbai, traveling is a big challenge. So uh, coming to the point, uh, Belinda. Uh, Many leaders are sitting in the group here. So the, the, the most important role of a leader, be it nursing leader or a hospital uh, you know, CEO or a director to speak in a hospital, the most important and uh, the very vital role that the leadership plays is to create an environment. Create an environment of, now I'll, I'll borrow or probably uh, borrow shamelessly from one of our earlier speakers is create an environment or a culture of ease, effectiveness and emotion. A culture which takes care of all this. If things come easily at the workplace, where the processes are set, the SOPs are very clear, then the clarity of rules, then what happens is the work becomes easy. So that is something which uh, I think in most workplaces, people speak about SOPs, you know. They talk about SOPs and protocols because these are clear cut, laid down, defined directions which tell an employee that if this happens, this is what you have to do. From You go from A to B to D to C and then finally to Z. So clear cut SOPs and protocols are laid down. There is ease of work. So often what happens is that uh, in our profession, nursing, the young nurse who comes into the clinical area or the workplace learns by trial and error. There's a lot of trial and error that happens. It you could, uh, could be because they have not got enough practice environment when they were studying or maybe uh, the, the quality of education imparted was not uh, so well prepared that the youngster when she comes into the field where she's actually dropped onto the shop floor not made ready to cope with all the challenges that she or he can face. So SOPs are very important. So that's one point. The other thing is effectiveness. Uh, a nurse, when he or she notices that whatever they do brings results, you know, it could be getting the diet on front, uh, in front of the patient immediately the moment she makes a call, or when uh, a patient get, uh, there are protocols that take care of patients' uh, uh, symptoms and she sees results or he or she sees results, then this is quite satisfying. So this again has an impact on uh, the satisfaction he or she takes home from the work environment. So ease in which we, he or she can practice the results, then there should be an environment where the grievances are addressed. If there is a problem, the leadership has a very big role in making an environment open, you know, so that a young nurse or a senior nurse they feel there is a, something not right. They should be having the confidence to step up and speak up. And leadership should be supported. So if you ask me, the role of leadership is to create ease, ease of practice, ease of speaking up, uh, ease to, you know, have the confidence to come and, you know, raise a flag if something is going wrong with patient care. There should be ease to, uh, to acquire improved knowledge. So leadership should be providing opportunities for growth, should be providing opportunities to improve education, like Prajita was saying. I also do not like the word training. I think education is what matters. So education should be an ever-growing, continual uh, thing, and leadership is uh, plays a very large role in that. Apart from that, uh, you know, creating uh, certain uh, departments within your system, which takes care of mentoring, which takes care of some kind of wellness you know, management for the nurses. So uh, we have in, my, in our uh, setup, I think uh, one of our, uh, my dear uh, colleague, um, she was the OT manager in Jaslo, unfortunately we lost her to Fortis. So, uh, so she was, she, uh, there's an anesthetist who practices, uh, you know, yoga. So often we have, uh, I do not say that these are things that are, you know, giving you sure shot success. But the thing is that, it takes care of uh, the burnout, that, so to speak. So I wouldn't say that our attrition is largely because of burnout. Our attrition that we face in, in the hospitals like ours is largely because of opportunities uh, overseas. But burnout does happen to the young nurse and the old if they are ill-prepared to face 
what is happening in front of them, if they are not knowledgeable, if their work-life balance is not, uh, you know, taken care of. In a city like Mumbai, where travel takes part, take almost two hours to travel to work. So what is the ease that you provide for them? These are some of the questions that as administrators, each of us sitting here in the audience should ask. So some wellness programs. Another thing is an open line of communication. There should be clear-cut communication, either through town halls or meetings with a larger group, so that some clear-cut expectations are set forth and defined. So these are some of the things that I can think of uh, uh, in terms of uh, evidence-based practices that a leadership can, you know, uh, support in us. So, well said, Roslyn, because I think these are the three factors which you have mentioned, and I think earlier project also has mentioned about it. Because we as nursing leaders, uh, even with shortage of nurses, attrition of nurses, burnout of nurses, the management ultimately requires or demands from nurses safe patient care and patient satisfaction and delight. So it's an everyday you know, a story that uh, uh, we, uh, we start with educating our nurses and re-educating and re-educating so that you know, we can meet the demands of the healthcare system. Sandhu, in the context of uh, nurses' retention is crucial for maintaining a skilled workforce. What evidence-based strategies can organizations employ to encourage nurse retention and reduce turnover rates? Thank you, Belinda, and good evening to all of you. Uh, now, just now, uh, Rosalind happened to tell that one of her best OT nurses was uh, she lost her nurse, the best OT nurse to Fortis. So let us find out the reason from her. What was her factor? So, uh, when this is what happens when we lose our nurses if the productivity goes down. Because the next nurse, we take a lot of time in developing her skill. When Fortis was good to uh, uh, gain because they got a trained nurse. So someone's loss is someone's gain. Okay, so going over to a few of the studies, let me just uh, uh, look at, I mean, we went through a lot of studies, or two of the studies, which were authored by Charlin and et al. Safeguarding the retention of nurses, a systemic review which was done in which 34 articles were reviewed. Now, what did it say? It said that in which 14 nations were looked into, out of which one was our nation also, it says that one out of six nurse is going to retire in 10 years from now on, which means to say that we have to increase the production of graduate nurses by 8% by 2030. If we have to come up by the nurse leavers, the equation has to be as equal to the nurse leavers by nurse joiners. That is, if the nurse leavers and the nurses who are joining, if they, we have to equalize, we have to increase the production of nurse graduates by 8% by 2030. So let us look at the other study which was published in BMJ. That is Association of 12 hour Shift and Nurses Job Satisfaction which was mentioned by Dr. Sneha which was authored by Shiara, Dal and Ital. Well, we all know that but the study concluded that longer shifts are associated by, with high burnout. Needless to say, we all know that. But definitely there is something that's all these studies, there are few factors. One is safety factor. Rosalind, which mentioned that uh, in Mumbai, it's a challenge to reach our place of work from home. That is two hours. And it is not only over here, it is global. So that is one safety factor which we, needs to, uh, which we need to check out, which is very common. So what are the two main factors in retention? One is a push factor and one is a pull factor. So what is pulled and somebody pushed. We need to find out what was the pull factor and what is the push factor. The main is the safety factor. Pay can be one of the factor which we all need to work out so that we all come at the equal, equal level. Education, we spend a lot of time in educating when the nurses come and join from one place to the other. So if we work out on all these factors, I think the retention levels can be much more better and attrition can be worked out. <coughs>
Thank you, Sindhu. I think we all face this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, aspect of push and pull. But I think in every aspect we have to see the positivity. So if your nurse has gone, Rosalind, to another hospital, you should be proud. <laughs> so that is the way uh, we look at or I look at because ultimately we are, you know, uh, in one way or the other strengthening our healthcare uh, fraternity or the healthcare sector. I may interrupt. I, it's unfortunate that I mentioned that. It went on getting quoted by every speaker. <laughs> no, but, uh, but I would like to clarify the quoted reason was the distance to travel to work and the fact that, uh, you know, that uh, she needed to spend more uh, attention to the people at home, which is a reality, something which uh, we all have to face. So I stand. Yes, so uh, let me uh, clarify. <laughs> Anyway, Rosalind, no regrets from your side because this is the reality and it's a fact that we all face. So coming to you, Ms. Sini, in the context of evidence-based practices, how can technology and digital solutions be utilized to alleviate nurse burnout and turnover and improve job satisfaction? Thank you again. Yeah, technology is the fan of uh, the generation. Uh, we should not be left behind. Technology, uh, do you believe that technology can reduce workload, reduce the employment number of people required? Researchers say no, it only increases. Okay, because on one way you may try to reduce something, the other way it requires something else. So, what is important with regards to technology is why is it required and who are we catering to and how are we catering it to? The why, who and the we providers are the how do we provide it to you. For example, everybody in every organization wants to have an EMR. Why do you want an EMR? Does it reduce a nurse's workload? Or the time consumed sitting in front of the computer? No, we require EMR because we want the whole of the patient related communication on a single platform. Yeah? <coughs> but how are we helping a nurse to cope up with this requirement where she needs to spend her two to three hours in front of that computer? As an organization, if you require an EMR, you need to provide the nurse to use it effectively. If you need a real-time documentation, then you need to provide tabs or you need to provide computers at the bedside. If you need that the nurse effectively and efficiently puts the data into the system, then you need to train her in, the, in that format and buy her approval before introducing this. Because she is the user. Okay? You need that all the data should be there, there should be no missing of data, then you need to help her with integration. And some of the simplest things are like your syringe pumps, your cardiac monitors can be integrated with EMR. So you don't have to type, sit on typing. You have scanners at the system. That can be utilized to enter your stock directly into your system. You can have a beautiful medication administration system in the EMR where the indent process of a nurse completely gets deleted. So whenever you want technology and if it is a requirement of the organization, the most important aspects which we need to focus on is why do we need it and how do I help my ground worker, that is my nurses, to ensure that they use this technology efficiently. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, we have heard in the earlier sessions also about technology in the field of nursing or in the field of healthcare. And I think uh, next time we can take a, a debate on this technology versus touch. I always tell my nurses and I think I repeat in most of the conferences where I can quote I always feel that the monitors, ventilators, syringe pump, infusion pumps must be smiling when the nurse comes to the bedside. 
because the nurses touch them more than the patients. So in the midst of technology, we should not forget that, that tender loving care or the TLC, what, what, how we call it, or the touch which is very important in treating and caring our patients. Dr. Sneha, could you highlight some evidence-based strategies in a broader perspective, which is probably not brought out by the other three experts out here, to reduce nurse burnout and enhance retention of nurses? Uh, yes. Uh, there are certain governing bodies, I wouldn't want to mention that, that have uh, brought, brought out or laid down certain uh, regulations that are there, uh, few that I can just talk about. Like when, uh, you know, the patients are there admitted in the hospital, how many of us nursing leaders ever think of the complexity of the illness of that patient that walks into the hospital? And how do we ever work around to see whether the competency of the nurse is decided and divided for that particular shift? Sometimes it is very, very difficult. So these governing bodies have come up with something called as patient equity or uh, something that you call as versus the skill matrix of the nurses that are there. So where you can decide, it's, it's a huge uh, mammoth of a thing where NABH is already asking for it, so many of the, some of the hospitals which are already NABH accredited, uh, they have to, uh, you know, follow this pattern of this patient equity matrix uh, skill set that is there, where you can chalk down all the important aspects of, you know, your complex patients, your moderate complex patients and your severely complex patients that are there. And at one glance, based on the comp uh, competency of your nurse, nurses, you can definitely decide uh, why these practices are important is because this is one of the factors which can uh, reduce or contributory factors which can reduce your uh, nurses burnout that is there. Second thing is as I already had uh, spoken to you is flexibility of certain duty hours that are there. If, you, if we can come up with something of that sort, I know it is very difficult in a scenario, it is very easy to sit across and speak about all these uh, strategies that are there. If we can work out something in that, certain flexibilities which can be provided to the uh, nurse. How many times do we ever call them and ask them, how was your duty, how was your day? Uh, how is this patient? Is this patient a little difficult for you? Are you trying to, have you even had a glass of water? How many of us even ask that particular question? So all these small, small things, there are big uh, kind of strategies that are always there. But these simple basic things will definitely move the needle and will, uh, you know, bring an importance to the nurse who is working at the, uh, you know, front uh, of the patient care. Other thing that I will also say is, accord, a, along with your patient equity, even the use of the equipments that are there, whether it is for the wards or whether it is in the ICUs, it is sometimes very, very difficult and very challenging how these nurses really manage in the end of an 8-hour shift or in the end of a 12-hour shift. So all these things we need to you know, jot down, we need to sit with the nurses itself to understand how we can bring in these changes that are, uh, you know, definitely there. Of course, I spoke about the pay parity. Yes, uh, during the COVID time, I really remember that uh, when there was a lot of shortage, suddenly there was a right, sudden rise of the, uh, you know, salary which just went up you know, because we wanted to save every nurse that was there so that she, he or she just doesn't walk out of the uh, institute. So it, we don't need a pandemic to remind us that we need to give importance to our nurse who is a newly uh, passed out nurse. We do not call them as freshers anymore. Uh, you know, a new registered nurse or an experienced nurse, we need to work out on all those uh, things. I will also talk about the work environment. How friendly is the work environment for the nurses to stay? That will also talk about 
uh, the education that is there, whether the education is continuous in practice or are we just deciding a norm that as a nurse you need to complete so many hours of training or so many hours of education uh, that is there. So many of these aspects which are there we can lay down and they are there by the uh, which are laid down by the governing bodies and as nursing leaders we uh, already have brought that into practices and these practices can definitely reduce the uh, burnout uh, that is what I feel. Yeah, thank you Dr. Sneha and I would just like to add uh, one is patient acuity and the other I think you have also mentioned about skill mix. Uh, uh, I'm sure that we all as nursing leaders are aware about hospital associations, you know. It's a group of uh, CEOs and medical directors uh, who come and discuss about uh, difficulties or challenges faced. Uh, uh, I would like nursing, nursing leaders also somewhere down the line to be a part of this uh, uh, association. Because uh, what, what I get to understand is, you know, they speak about because of the shortage of nurses, uh, the, the, the talk is to introduce more of nursing assistants. Uh, somewhere down the line, I think uh, probably, you know, the non-nursing administrators are not very clear on who's a auxiliary nurse midwife and who's a nurse assistant. So if we are going to take nurse ass assistants, nursing assistance, you know, to combat or to maintain the number and to, you know, um, engage in skill mix where they can give basic care and nurses can focus on advanced care. Uh, as uh, you were speaking about governing bodies or regulatory bodies, there has to be proper job descriptions, you know, from the medical legal points of point of view, what a nursing assistant can do if she's employed in a particular organization. And the second, uh, the second point which I would like to just add is about nursing education, uh, which we have seen in the earlier sessions also. Uh, the challenges that we face when a new recruit or a new graduate comes to us is one of the communication skills. So that is one uh, you know, factor that we need to keep in mind. Uh, and I'm sure most of, most of us do it to help them to communicate effectively uh, to the patients in the language known by the patients because that's the real challenge that we, that we come across and uh, that is also maybe, you know, uh, we can incorporate. Rosalind, now you have been listening since uh, from all the experts to different strategies. It's very easy for us to sit here and talk and it's uh, a real challenge to implement out there. Um, so could you highlight on a few on a few challenges that you face in implementing these various strategies? Okay, so quickly because uh, we won't take much time. So uh, some of the challenges that I we face as administrators, I'll just enumerate that, and then some of the challenges that I think we wish we could change. So primarily education again. So I, uh, today our, uh, our, uh, our curriculum, the nursing curriculum, I think we are quite detached or maybe not at all connected with what is happening in, in our uh, uh, real world of patient care. So that curriculum revamping is uh, so much the need of the hour. We talked about acuity, we, uh, Sini talked about technology. So, and uh, in the earlier sessions we had panelists talk about clinical outcomes and uh, quality parameters. So these are some of the things that we, just, that there is a dire need to incorporate that into our curriculum. So when the, the graduate nurse comes into the uh, workplace, they are already aware of a lot of things. That's one. Second thing is education when they are working, within the work environment. Uh, first and foremost is that you have to get the new person coming into the system engaged with the organization. How would you do that? By having a very, very strong, well-defined onboarding program. The onboarding program will not only be that first 12 days of induction classes. There has to be a well-designed program which should, should last at least six months. I don't think we have the luxury of, you know, or at least three months. We don't have the luxury of doing that. So onboarding program can be mixed and matched with their work hours so that they have some kind of flexibility to attend uh, some education sessions. We could make it virtual, you know, but and this would keep the connect and the engagement would improve. A strong onboarding program is what I strongly recommend. I've tried this now where I am coming from. Uh, the first 12 days of induction did not prepare my nurse to, uh, you know, handle real life situations. 
So what we've done is we've tried to pull them out for a month and every day give them one hour of engagement. Now it's not only training, um, excuse me, it's not only educating them, uh, but it is also a way to connect with them, you know, connect with them, understand what is happening in their day to day lives when they are on the shop floor, on the patient floor, what are the challenges that they face. And also an opportunity for them to ventilate that I face this difficulty and I have somebody to whom I can talk to. So that's one a very good onboarding program, education outside and when they are in the system. So these are the challenges that I'm sure all of us face and some solutions that I mentioned. Then lack of resources. Sometimes we do not have resources like I've heard some earlier speakers saying that one of the biggest challenges that I face is space. If I want to get a person out, a few group of girls out, a boys out for training, sometimes I do not have the space. Because we are an educational institution, so we have a lot of education program for doctors also. So there is a lot of push and pull for space. And the other thing is nurse patient ratios. And we are not able to replace the nurses as they go. You know, nurses will go very quickly, but then you don't get replacements as quickly because there is a crunch, you know, we don't get nurses on time. So there is a lack of resources in terms of space, in terms of people, in terms of very experienced educators who can impart uh, information and knowledge to the uh, nurses. These are some of the challenges that I face. And sometimes your own, there are legacy issues. The organization is, like how I come from an organization that's 50 years old. So 50 years old, there are legacy issues. We used to do it like this. So resistant to, you know, to change, to adopt new ideas. So these are some of the things. So this all is, I don't think that these are insurmountable. These are challenges that will get solved with continuous education, continuous communication, communicate, communicate, communicate. That's as leaders, this is the most important role that everybody should, uh, you know, uh, take upon themselves and uh, do. The other thing is lack of empathetic leadership. Not understanding that a person has to work here, go back to home, and uh, there is a family waiting for them, you know. So that's also a lack of uh, empathy towards the worker is also very, very important. So if somebody is living in the hostel, look after the hostel, look after their travel, look after the facilities that are... Uh, so uh, again, here there will be a constraint of budget. Uh, Prime uh, property, how to get that, how much to uh, charge them, do we give the hostel free? These are some of the questions that and challenges that administrators face. So, uh, apart from that, uh, and there are many other challenges. I'm sure Belinda will uh, question uh, and you know ask a few of you. So, these are a few things that I can think of. Thank you, Rosalind. But actually, while you were speaking, I thought I was speaking. <laughs> so, uh, how many leaders out here, nursing leaders? Can you please raise your hands? Rosalind has mentioned quite a few challenges. Do you affirm, concur with her challenges? Yes. So we all uh, face this day in and day out because we feel okay, we do it very systematically. We go planning our day. By the end of the day, we do not know what we have done. I really we have done something or no. But this is the everyday fight that we have at our workplace. A new nurse com comes in, we train her, we develop her. And then by the time she's, uh, you know, ready to take up the challenge at the workplace, she says bye-bye to us. So this is a everyday story that now is a part and parcel of us. So I think we have learned how to handle it and, uh, you know, swim the, uh, uh, swim the stormy uh, waters. So next question comes to you, Sindhu. Do you think there are any more researches that could be conducted to help us understand the reasons for burnout, attrition, and you know, which will help us to bring in some more strategies? When I was, uh, when I was going through the papers, what I felt is something which was missing is, uh, am I horrible? Uh, so what I felt, uh, what was missing is, uh, what would be, uh, how, uh, would it make a difference uh, if the nurses were the decision makers in an organization? So, uh, what I feel is, if the nurses are the decision makers in an organization, maybe the burnout would be less. Giving an example from the place where I come from, we have many nurse-led clinics. 
we are an organization we, which uh, have a very high footfall, maybe around from 3,000 to 4,000 patients per day. Uh, so we have nurse-led clinics like uh, CIVAT clinic, CVID clinic, stoma clinic, pain clinic, and the casualties are also run by nurses mainly. But they do get tired, but the burnout is not seen. The reason is maybe because they are the decision makers. And these are, these are the research where I found lacking. Maybe we could check out if we, may, we empower them, maybe that would make a difference. So maybe we could work out in some courses, you know, where the nurse practitioner courses can be created and the curriculum and the syllabus can be made wherein they would be made empowered and the decision can be done so that they would be able to run these places and which would enable them to work better and the burnout and the retention can be reduced. Because these are the reasons why they are looking at other places. Definitely pay parity is one of the reasons. Why we don't have retention is because we pay good. Definitely our benefits are much, much better because government is with us. We have good leave benefits. We have flexible, we, we don't have flexible hours, but we work on flexible hours. We were ask the nurses and we give them flexible hours. We give staggered, staggered shift. So I think these are the places, you know, where we can work out Indian research can be done so that to check out how well we can do. I have nurses who come from Bayandar and Vasai, so all kind of duties don't suit them. A 7, 1.30, reaching home at 11.30 or 12.30, 1 a.m. at night doesn't suit these girls. So we work out in such a way so that, you know, they are, as uh, Rosalind mentioned, work-life balance is very important. So uh, not giving them night immediately as soon as they join up from maternity leave, not giving them night when they are pregnant, not giving them night uh, till the time a bit they are comfortable. If you are having a good number of nurses, as Madam Sonavne had mentioned, we relieve nurses every year for masters. Uh, we leave our per contract nurses also to do their courses and we take them back. These are some ways, you know, where the contributing factors the full pull factors can be worked down and the work research can be done on these to check out how we can retain them. Thank you, Sindhu. Good insights. And uh, I think uh, we can, you know, uh, do many uh, studies on nurses who want to pursue masters or PhD nursing. Or even if, if, uh, if not like that, you know, in our own institutes, we can conduct small studies to understand uh, what are the reasons and how we can improve, uh, you know, the work environment to uh, retain the nurses or to uh, reduce the burnout of nurses. So, uh, what do you have to say? Should I ask them the last question, which we had kept for, for us? What do you What do you say? You throw it to the audience. Fine, audience, are you with us? Yes. Are you with us? Yes. Are you with us? Yes. Fine. So now I had uh, put a few questions in the beginning, but. Uh, you can add on to it. Anyone would or any, maybe we can take uh, uh, from five of you some strategies or some uh, stories, success stories, which you feel were implemented at your place of work, which has helped to reduce the burnout of nurses or helped you to retain nurses. If not nurses, at least one nurse. So uh, can you tell us your success stories? So we want five success stories, huh? Good evening. Yeah. Uh, I come from the same institute as Madam Sindhunaya comes. Yes, Swati. We do have 50% uh, nurses who are permanent and 50% nurses who are on contract. So we had two different patterns for them. Permanent nurses had a different pattern, whereas the temporary nurses and some of the new nurse A's also, miss new nurses, had a pattern like two days morning, two days evening, two days uh, night, and two days off. Then again, the same pattern repeats. But so, during the exit interviews, we came to know, some of them mentioned that this two days pattern, your, uh, the cycle also takes time to adapt, 
and also it's difficult because you know that in a month I am again going to get night, again going to get night. So that was something disturbing for them. And even in that, uh, in the life uh, house, uh, it was difficult for them to manage. So we worked out on that, and we have regularized the pattern throughout entire uh, nursing. And uh, we had a good response from the nursing staff. And we were, I think, successful. We started it very slowly from one department, and then we felt that uh, whatever hitch was there, we could try to handle that. And we have covered the entire TMH uh, uh, with a similar pattern, and our nurses are really happy with all that. Thank you. Good. Let's move to the next one. Next one, number two. Or oh, you won't move out of this auditorium. Number two. Come on, Rajatta. How are we here? Keep yourselves ready, huh? Or oh, we can have dinner here and go, no problem. Hello. Am I audible? Yes. So we have a pattern of six, six. My name is Pooja Abule. I am from Nama Healthcare as a nursing head. So we have a pattern of six six twelve, which we see commonly in other hospital that eight 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 hours pattern is there. Otherwise, we have twelve twelve hours pattern. But here we have made it six six twelve because the girls are more happier to do regular. 12 hour shift as a night. So they at stretch do for 4 to 5 days when they have to do night for 12 hours. But it is 8 to 8. So the traveling and everything they are very safe because they have to leave early and they reach on a proper time at home. But when it comes to a morning and the evening, so 6 hours pattern makes them reach at home properly and they are able to manage their household things also within that time. So it becomes very easy for them. So I never get burnout out regarding the duty timings from the nurses. So they are very happy. Thank you. Number three. Number three. Yeah. Number three. Yeah, Rajakta. Who is going to be number four? Raise your hand right now. Number four and number five. Yeah. And number five. Can I go ahead? Yes. So I have two things to share. I think our bridge candy is known for 12 hour shift. But it's not taxing because we give them three days off. And the four days we don't make them do duty together. So it's one day, then off, then two days, then off, then one day. So it works out and uh, you know sometimes they don't have to take PA if they get three offs of this week and next week. So that way they are very happy and as uh, Pooja mentioned that they can leave, they don't have to leave very early and they reach home also, it's not too late. And for the executive nurses, we, like we have two categories, they have two days off and that also we have given them flexible timings. Those who are coming from far, they, they, are, they are in the hospital before 7 and they can leave by 3, 3.30. And you know, those who want to do 8 to 5, they do 8 to 5. And they, they, they have freedom to decide which day they want to take off. So it works out well. And second uh, well-being thing which we have started is we have a yoga session on two days in a week. And it, they can combine with their lunch break. It's 1 to 2. Again, that is the time we get auditorium free. Nobody wants to use. So Miki Mehta's team come to our hospital. And uh, many seniors and non-nursing people also enjoy this yoga session. And a lot of good things they do and they are really regenerated before lunch. So they two batches can take the advantage and it's working out well. Thank you. Thank you, Rajatta. Yes, how are we? I think uh, you all are reminding us about the time. So how we don't remind us about the time again. We were also having a shift so earlier we had a SOP that anyone who is traveling uh, from outside who is a non-hostelite so we were not giving them the evening shift because you know it's too late for them to reach home. So that led to a problem that it was overtaxing the hostel girls. 
because they would repeatedly uh, get those shifts and the outside girls would repeatedly get a morning and a night so with families and all it was difficult so we brought about a change so right now what we are doing is 7 hours of morning 7 hours of evening and 10 hours for the night and now equal distribution of all three shifts among hostelite or outsiders so that is helping us a lot other uh, grievance was related to the hostel because our hostel food and hostel coupon and all was a compulsion because uh, we wanted to prevent them from falling sick by you know eating outside or uh, eating wrong food so th those approvals i have got because all the youngsters nowadays they want to order from zomato so i can i i convinced uh, management that at our own house also in spite in spite of having the best of the food or whatever our kids still wants to order and my sons will still eat you know they will still order from zomato so we should not be putting any such restrictions on a hostel girl uh, because she should feel same like what she would have done when she was at home so if in my house my son is allowed to order a zomato and eat whatever he feels like eating the why should i put a restriction so we have uh, you know brought about that change and now uh, there is no compulsion so the girls can order girls can go out there are night out passes so they don't feel as if they are you know in a jail so all those uh, equality freedom we have uh, given to our girls that's nice how we and especially in a city like mumbai i think we should enjoy the eateries right yeah Thank you for doing that for your nurses. <laughs> Thank you. So, is there any number five? I'm so sorry, you raised your hand over. Good evening, everyone. I'm Cynthia, and I'm the nursing head at uh, HCG Kolaba. Previously, I was at uh, HCG Nagpur as the chief of nursing. So, um, this story is about Nagpur. <laughs> so, uh, we have this uh, compulsion that every nursing head or chief of nursing has to take 20% of physician feedback every month. So, you have to rotate and every physician you have to meet, take their feedbacks. But this is not just because they want us uh, to um, find out what the flaws are in nursing from the consultant side and keep on teaching and training and teaching and training. It is also because that also becomes a proof to show that yes, the consultants also believe that we are doing something, some improvement is taking place or we are doing very well. Um, but it is also um, helping us with one more thing that is interpersonal relationships. When the nursing head has a good inter interpersonal relationship with the consultants, with the other HODs, it helps the nurses. So this has really helped. Uh, I used to also spend 10 minutes of my uh, day, every single day of my duty, meeting, meeting one HOD of another department and just having a chat, talking to them, figuring out solutions where the nurses and their department people also, you know, uh, will not get burned out and we can work together as a team and we also have some problems we also have other things to do. So we used to talk like this and we had the friendship and slowly, slowly the department people and the nurses also started having that friendship. They gelled off well and we had 0% attrition for the next three months. So it worked off well. Thank you. That's a really good uh, move. Communication with collaboration. You know, it, it uh, makes a lot of difference, uh, you know, uh, to get things uh, done in the right manner. So, uh, any one of you would just like to add to it before we make them? Yeah. Uh, I will say one thing, I think so, not missed by us, but uh, we definitely do rewards and recognitions. Okay? Because it is very important. Uh, I am not saying very big thing about the Apollo, but uh, definitely I would like to bring this to your notice. Our consultants play a very, very important role in the feedbacks. And they push the envelope to see that this particular nurse is recognized for the month. 
So they have their own kind of suggestions, whether it is at the OT, whether it is at the wards, or whether it is at the ICUs. So what happens, these kind of small recognitions are identified as Apollo stars of every month. So every unit, they will recognize their own performers that are there. Why? For nursing, we will have our performers identified either by us or by the consultants or it could be by the immediate patient feedbacks that we take. So these play a very, very important role because that boosts the energy uh, of the nurse who is there. And, uh, at our place, maximum, we have almost 350 nurses who are the hostilites and we have very, very few nurses who are the localites. So there is a lot of discussions which happens in you know, in the single building where they change, where they exchange. And uh, to add on, yes, we do have nurses who abscond because they couldn't make it, they couldn't manage, they couldn't follow the protocols, they just walk out. And the next month they come back saying that, I thought it was difficult, but I want to work back, can you give me a chance? And I do give the chance. And that is where this whole mix of this burnout. I'm not saying we're doing something great. But if we do our part little by little, I'm, I'm sure that we'll be able to, uh, you know, send a word of mouth to the nurses that are across. Yes, they leave and go, but they definitely remember the, uh, you know, the institute for what we have helped them build themselves to be the best nurses for the country. So, uh, team on the dais and team off the dais. I think we are doing a great job in spite of all the challenges that we face at our workplace and we are doing our best to help our nurses chill out, if I can use this word, and to you know retain them. So, all the best to all of us and I would just like to add a quote before we end. It's a war of burn out and attrition. If you have patience and modicum or faith in yourself, your choices are not that bad. Thank you. Let's have a huge round of applause for the stellar panel and the very discussion. I now request Dr. Melinda to please felicitate the co panelists.
interesting space of the Nursery Conclave 2023 and uh, before we bid adieu, I'd like to put some words of thanks for all our partners without whom this event wouldn't have been possible. Our presenting partner, Quick Smart Wash, our silver partner, Satisfaction Farm, our associate partners, Bodhi Learning and 3M, our knowledge partner, PD Hinduja College of Nursing, our hospital partner, Jupiter Hospital, our corporate partners, Akas Infusions, Seni, Max Life, Himalaya Baby Care and Life Science and our supporting partners, Association of Healthcare Providers India and Critical Care Nurses Society. I'd also like to thank all the speakers, all the delegates, all the organizing committee members, everyone on stage, off stage who've uh, put their efforts in making this event a success. Uh, without you, it was nothing. So I'd like to thank all of you and stay tuned for the second edition of Nursing Conclave in the August of 2024. It's going to be an even higher energy and even higher participation and I hope to see all of you once again. And uh, let's celebrate the extraordinary contributions of our nurses and uh, let's take home a wealth of knowledge and inspiration. Let's all gather near the stage for a big group photograph. And uh, with this, I, Dr. Nishan Sharma, would like to thank you and uh, have a good evening. Let's let everyone come forward please for a big group photograph. Let's all come, come ahead. Kaka, kaka, signing करने तो मंदिर का, इतने बस